Hello explorers and welcome to another video. Today we are going to talk about Seth. And Seth is a disk storage solution to give you endless storage. And what do I mean by endless storage? In this case, it's you connect some disk to somewhere and you send data there to that place and it will be distributed between different machines or hard drives and so on in order to make it both robust and make it a stream where you can actually extend this hard drive so it becomes larger. It will go over a network and so on, so you will have some drawbacks when it comes to performance, but you can store uh, limitless amounts of data in theory. So let's look at such a close cluster here. So this is my setup on my machine. It's currently running. So that means that I have less compute for this recording. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, so here we have a SEPT cluster and we see that the health is okay. And to start off, this is Octopus the uh, version 15 I'm running now, and I have shut it down and uh, taken it up again, and it starts up and works just fine. In Debian systems, there is a release 12, Luminous, I think it's called, and I tried to get that one running, just installing all the packages that came with the Debian distribution of Buster, and that did not work at all. If you were shutting, shutting down some of your nodes, uh, they will never really go back to a healthy state. And that's because in these uh, clusters, you have um, groups of uh, pop, groups of data that you send over to different machines and these PGs, um, petitions groups, uh, did not align. They were on the wrong place all the time and they couldn't really figure out where they should store them. And the job of a monitor in this case is to tell the system where everything is placed and where everything should be placed. So it's uh, where it's the, the master record of where everything is uh, in your system. And that's what we see here. And I actually have two monitors which are in quorum. They are they have decided that they have the same information and they are satisfied by that. Usually when you run this kind of a system, you should have three monitors. So one of them could die and you still have uh, full redundancy. Uh, next up, we need somewhere to store all this data. And this is the object storage daemon here. I have four of those and it's not a machine with a lot of disks in it. It's actually four different disks. But if you spread them out on different machines, you will get redundancy. So they say you should at least have three machines with OCDs, uh, OSDs, but uh, they don't need to have that many disks. So in this case, I have four machines, but only four disks. So I only have four OD OSDs, but you can add more of those. And that's the interesting part here that you have monitors and other services that are running and then you just add more disks, more disk demons. And next up we have this manager demon here. I have one active, one standby and those are actually running on the monitor machine. So they are the same uh, set up, but the manager demons is pretty much what we are looking at now. It's something where you can get a GUI, you can get some stats and so on and see what's happening. And in the background you actually have a Grafana server that handles the statistics for you and gives you nice graphs and so on, but the manager demons are what actually are displaying this. Totally, total we have seven hosts in the system. We have no object gateways. You can actually use this as an object store if you like. And there are different other services in this as well. Uh, we have metadata service. Uh, they recommend that you have at least two of those for performance, but those are uh, servers that you can connect to and uh, they help you with 
find operations and list operations and so on in your cluster. So they hold, holds all the metadata that is required to do fast searches and so on. And then we have uh, SCSI gateways. I don't have, I haven't set up any of those either. Uh, I'm not using SCSI for this. I use, I connect with a simple uh, mount in Linux, and that works fine in order to get that disk. And here we have some performance throughput and the capacity of the system. And we see here that we have raw capacity of 167 gigabytes left of. Uh, 195 gigabytes. So I have actually set up four di different servers with 50 gigabytes in them, roughly. But because we want redundancy over this, I can't really use the whole 200 gigabytes. I believe that you get around 80 gigabytes of disk storage when you spread it out over the different hosts. So let's look at the setup for this cluster. We go over to my client here. So this is something that I will connect to and I use Ansible to install this cluster. So I set up a bunch of servers and then if we look at my uh, hosts file here, I collected all the IPs for these hosts. So you see that I have two monitor machines, four OSDs, one MDS, which is this metadata service. I have my client and my Grafana server. So I've decided where these are and set up the different IPs in my cluster and I just install them like uh, clean Debian installs. I have this script where I talked about in a different video, you can look at that, where you can add keys so you can go into a system with SSH. So if I SSH to one of the monitors here, I can do that without a password. And then I will prepare each of these systems so I can sudo to be com root and also installed pact on the OSDs because they will uh, partition different hard drives so they need to have that functionality in it. And it, the script I'm gonna run for the uh, Ansible is not set up to add pact to the systems. It, it expects it to be there. So I had to add it here in order to not get any errors. And if we look at my Ansible uh, script here for sept, let's see, first we need to look at the hosts. So see here that I have different grow groups for hosts here. We have the, the Grafana server host uh, group. We have the monitor group, the managers, which are the same as the monitors the OSDs, which are this group, and then MDSs. And the naming of these groups are important for the Ansible script in order to find which server it should do which operations on. After that, I downloaded or checked out the Seth Ansible, and that will be found in the Git repository that you find in the description of this video. And here we have a lot of different scripts. What I did was this site YAML here. If you have a site sample, I just copied that. And if we look uh, at this site YAML, it tells you what the groups should be uh, up here. So you know which groups you can use in order to install different functionality. I tried to add a client's group and add my client there to get some of the installation. Uh, I suggest you install the client separately, manually using just installing the different packages and then connecting from there because clients are very uh, easy to set up in, in reference. But uh, I didn't th see that the, the script added the client correctly. So uh, I skipped that and did it ma manually. And when we have this uh, repository here, we need to do one more thing in order to get it up and running. We need to go into group vars. And here you have different groups that you can set up different variables for. So for instance, you could, if we have the OCDs here, you can set up specific uh, specific 
parameters that you want for all your OSDs. But I wanted to set for all my different systems. So I have just one of these and that's all YAML. And here I set up everything that is required to install sept using this package. First I need to tell it what, what is the origin of what you want to install. In this case I use the repository of sept. You could use your distribution, Debian, I tried that. Did not work well because it was a very old one. And you can also say what repository do you want to install from. And in this case I wanted to install from the community based one. You can buy a license and install that one if you like. And then we have the release. And as I told you before, Octopus is that one I run now. It's the 15 release of Sept. I believe that's the latest release and it's uh, working very well for me. Uh, then you set up a public and a cluster network. So the cluster network is which network the different machines should talk to each other. And that can be different from the public network where you can go to the different monitors or managers and look at the statistics and so on. So you can set up different networks for the different kind of traffic here. Then we have the man ma monitor interface. And you can either say that this should be a specific address that you should uh, go for the monitor on or you can say uh, the interface and in this case I chose the interface because all the machines are exactly identical so they have the same interface everywhere so it was easier to just say look at this interface when you set up the monitors. The Grafana server needs an admin and a password because you can log into it and look at the graphs there. I've not done that but uh, it needs this setup to be secure. And then we need this dashboard that we looked on, needs an admin user and a password. And here's a very important caveat. If you choose a very bad password here, the installation will fail and it will tell you that it can't put the admin user into the administrator group because the admin user is not found. That's not a great um, error message for I could not create the admin user because you chose a password that was too weak. Uh, so it took a while for me to figure that one out. But you need a sufficiently uh, advanced password for your admin in order to get this uh, up and running. And then we can tell it for Debian only if you want the distro backports to be used. I don't want any packages from my distro in this case be, to be used. I only want the repository packages. So here I have put that to false. If you're not running Debian, because this can be installed on any distribution or a lot of them, I think they had a list of about 15 distributions that they supported. So if you're not running Debian, this is not for you. Then we have the SEP directories. I said that uh, they should have 755. It's just so uh, most of the users on the system can reach them. And I'm not sure if this is actually required. I just put it in there. Uh, it seemed to be just a, a good thing to have in my system. Uh, containerized deployment. I don't want a lot of different Docker environments. It will install some of the, the things in Docker, but I don't want everything to be containerized uh, because in this case I run it on the bare metal, metal and I don't want any more overhead on my cluster. Uh, next up we have the FSID and this is if you want to say this cluster should have this ID and identify it with this ID. It's mostly interesting if you have different cluster in the same network so the, the only uh, cluster members should be talking to only this uh, cluster. But usually you only have one cluster so this is not super important to have specified here. If you don't specify it, it will pick one at random and then keep that in your Ansible um, 
cache directory. So you don't need to uh, stress too much about uh, choosing a good one here. There is a tooling in Seth to uh, generate an UUID gen that will give you this kind of a, a string. So that could be used for that. And then we have the journal size here. I put it to uh, 10, uh, gigabyte, uh, 10 megabytes. Uh, it's not that important either, but uh, it was one of the things that was recommended in the long list of uh, parameters that you should set something. And because my cluster is not that large, uh, this seemed to be a good choice. If you have a larger cluster, journal sizes can differ, so uh, it could be something that you are required to specify. And then we have devices, and that's specific for the OSDs. Which devices on the OSDs should have a daemon for your uh, object storage? So if you, for instance, have OSDs with 10 um, different devices on them, so you have 10 hard drives, uh, then you can just add a list of all the hard drives that you wanted to create daemons for, and it will set up the daemons for each hard drive, which is very nice. And if you add an extra OSDs, you can limit your Ansible script to run on just that machine with those hard drives specified for that machine. And it will create OSDs for that. Uh, something that you need to figure out is how much uh, resources this cluster actually takes. And in this case, the monitors and the managers, the managers don't, don't really take that much. The monitors needs at least two gigabytes of memory and some CPU because they will handle a lot of traffic and figure out where everything is placed. So they need some, uh, some compute capacity. The uh, MDSs for the Meta server, they need more capacity, so around uh, four gigabytes and uh, the OSDs, they need the most. They need a few, a lot of CPU because they will run multiple processes uh, usually. And each process needs at least one gigabyte of memory per terabyte of disk storage. So let's see that you ha say that you have two terabyte disks eight different disks in this uh, OCDs, then you should have two times eight gigabytes of memory. So 16 gigabytes at least, I would say 32 easily, because the uh, caching that goes on on the machine is in memory. So the more memory and compute power you can have in your OCDs, the better the performance will be in your cluster. So now I have actually covered most of the setup of this uh, script. Uh, running Ansible with a playbook is pretty simple. It just Ansible playbook. And then in this case, the site YAML that we talked about earlier, you could add a limit on it for let's say one specific OCDs. And then I had this become and uh, K for giving it the username of the pseudo user. So that's how I ran this Ansible playbook and set up this uh, specific cluster. Uh, I didn't have any limits on it when I installed this one because I needed to install all the services. Uh, but as it's already up and running, I will not run that again. If you have it running, or if you have ran it and you get some error, you can correct that thing and just rerun the Ansible script and it will continue. So that's a very good way to get this up and running. Uh, I hope that you found this video interesting. I hope that you learned something today. Are you running a uh, SEPT cluster and have some uh, experience about uh, this? leave a comment down below, or if you find this interesting and want to discuss it with me, I read all comments, leave a comment. If you like this video, give it a like, share it with your friends and colleagues. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do that, and I really hope to see you in the next video.